start the audio cafe as well. So this morning, uh, what we're what we're going to be doing, uh, looking at, is the pattern of seven and uh, why that is important. Uh, <coughs> can anybody tell me the reason why the pattern of seven is important, or why why do you think it's good for us to to study this? Anyone? mentioned in the bible over and over yeah it's sometimes when when people say things uh like your father or <laughs> some important person in your life they say things over and over again maybe there's a reason why maybe we're not catching something right and we can only do this because we are at the tail end of um a succession of um, Bible exegetes and interpreters, right? And we're in, we're in the 21st century, and some say we may be the the last generation. Um, well, of course, every generation says they are the last generation. <laughs> every generation uh, reads the Bible, uh, you know, with this apocalyptic slant. But more so in in uh, what Paul calls the prism of time, right? Uh, we may just be the last generation, but but uh, what uh, be that as it may, the fact is that we can look back. You know, we can look back thousands of years, and there is a certain amount of clarity there that's spoken about um, by Jesus in. Um, the scriptures. So let's let's go to the scriptures now, and let's take a look at um, the scripture in uh, Luke chapter ten. All right, Luke chapter ten twenty four. So, uh, somebody like to read. Uh, For I tell you that many prophets and kings uh, desired. Okay, so just take that line first and, and take note that you're looking for two words that look like prophet and kings, right? Obviously, it's quite clear on the first line of the Greek text there that uh, you have prophet, prophetai, and basileus, which is quite easily identified by the eye. So it's all about um, pattern recognition, right? And then he has this curious dance or poetry, right? To see what you see and did not see it. So you've got three occurrences of the word see, but in different forms, form endings. And in fact, uh, what looks like a different root ending altogether, a different word altogether, right? And then to hear what you hear but did not hear it. This one is easier. On the third line of the Greek text there, you have um, akuo, the same as in the English word acoustics, right? And um, But the last, you still have the ku, right? A ku So you, you, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't fluctuate as much as aiden or blepo in the second line there okay so somebody like to um uh give it a try um uh line by line go ahead first line please lego beginning with lego gar Mm -hmm. Go ahead, someone. Ligo gar omin hutei huloi prophetai kai baselius. Mm, good. All right. Someone like to thank you, Jess. Um, someone else like to do the second line. A little bit tricky. Go ahead.
Esi lisan ay din ha homis blimethi kai o ay dan. Good. All right. And then last line, please. Perhaps I try. This is mock, uh, Pastor Jerry. Go ahead. Uh, Kai, Okusai, Pa, Akuete, Kai, Ok, E, Kosan. Mm, good. So now you can check your work there. Um, the meaning is derived from the, we reverse engineer this first, okay? Because we're English readers trying to read the interlinear. We're not trying to study Greek or memorize the declensions or the nouns and, and all these kind of things. We're English readers who don't want to waste all the research that's already been done. Now, if you're listening to this lesson on the audio recording, you cannot see what the rest of the people are seeing, the students are seeing on the screen. So make sure that you also download the accompanying um, uh, uh, the accompanying PDF so that you can see what we're what we're <laughs> what we're seeing. Okay, um, yeah, and not just here because you wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to decipher. So he, this is a, a good example of the fact that as long as you can see uh, the English translation at the top there of Luke 10, 24, right? For I tell you that many, right? And straight away, you know that poloi is many, right? Prophets and kings, there's your word prophet. So you, you check there on the first line, you can, your eye can recognize the word prof fe tai and basileus, all right? Because bas, basilica in, 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 in Spain, in, in South America, in, in Philippines, a bas, basilica in Italy, it's a church of, with a dome. It's a grand church kind of thing. It's a building, right? But actually, the original idea behind um, uh, basilica was talking about a kingdom, right? So the idea of uh, the the church and the king being connected what came about as a result of the Holy Roman Empire emperor who was a king like a king a political king with armies and so on and so forth um, and a realm but that realm included uh, the church at that time the Roman Catholic Church so in one man you had both the Pope as well as a ruler like a Charlemagne or something like that, a political ruler, a, a warrior. So um, that was how the um, medieval period and even earlier during the Roman times, the once the emperor was converted to Christianity, that means after 400, after 500 AD, 500 years after Jesus, once the Roman emperors were Christianized, right? It took about 400 years. Once they were in church, in Sunday school, the, these Roman emperors took on the role of the head of the church as well. And so the entire empire became Christian. So that's why they call it the Holy Roman Empire. Okay? So... But but here he's not talking about the Holy Roman Emperor because this is this predates this. This is going back into the kings of Israel, the kings of um, the the ancient Near East. Yeah, um, the one the kings that you learn about in history history books um, who ruled the world, right? Even Alexander the Great, that kind of king. Right, um, 
Artaxerxes, and so on and so forth. And then prophets, right? So that's quite clear in, in Jewish history. So he says, for I tell you, many prophets and kings desired. So look at the first word in the second line there. there there's that fellow word that you're looking for, but it's changed its form a little bit and augmented with an eta. So it's a thale son. So desired. So what do you desire? What do you live for? What keeps you up at night? The answer is to see these things. Revelation. Without revelation, we'll be blind. We have no food to eat. Spiritual, spiritually, we are lost. We're like a person drifting or a castaway in, at, at sea. Okay? So um, this brings us to discrete revelation. But before this, let's uh, let's give a try. Someone try to uh, 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 let, let's have another three readers um, and try to read line by line, beginning with Lego Gar. Okay, if you haven't read, give it a try. Uh, try to do one line, and then uh, another person will be, do the second line, and so on and so forth. Go ahead. Lagogar. Lagogar homin hoti poloi prophetai kai basileis. Okay. Um, Nazel, you wanna uh, um, do the, the 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 whole verse? Okay. Etele san eden ha humis. Repete kai uk aidan kai akusai ha ako akuite kai uk ekosan. Mm, good. Um, Translation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I say for you, I say for to you that many prophets and kings. Decide to see what you see and not so, and hear what you hear and not hear. Hmm. So this, this brings us to a, a very interesting point, which we ended the last session uh, thinking about. When we talk about the pattern of seven, which is the theme or the subject matter that we're looking at, uh, the the discrete approach to modalities, um, as you can see here in this menorah that's been etched on on this uh, rock over three thousand years old, right? They they found it in Saudi Arabia. They suspect that maybe Moses and the the uh, the children of Israel actually were 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 living around this area. They found many evidences of um, a encampment. So. When Moses was looking at this, um, what did he see, right? Of course, the, this was just one of seven pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. That's menorah. Yes, uh, the menorah. Okay, so you can say, okay, Nazel says, oh, that's a menorah. Um, we have different names for a menorah. We have lampstand, we have candlestick, right? We've got different English words for it. But the, when he saw the seven branches, you count the number of branches there. It should be seven, right? Did anything come to mind? Did any bells go off in Moses' head, right? You think about the seven species in the land that was promised to the uh, Israelites. And you think about the seven enemies uh, including the Canaanites um, that were uh, uh, ready to be dispossessed by the armies of God, right? Because of their sin and their, their wickedness and idolatry, right? What was going on in Moses' mind? I mean, definitely he couldn't look forward. I don't think so. He could look forward to Paul. When Paul enumerates seven 
ecclesial archetypes, right? Prophetia, diaconia, didasco, parakleo, metadidomi, proestemi, elios. He couldn't have known that. But maybe Paul could look back on Moses, right? When he was enumerating the gate and the fire altar and the laver and the lampstand and the table of showbread and the incense, you know, incense and then the Ark of the Covenant. Maybe Paul could have known about Paul, Moses. Definitely he would have known the name Moses, but would he have seen that there's a correspondence between gate and prophet, um, between gate and, and proistomy, between fire altar and uh, Elias, between labor and didasco, between lampstand and prophetia, between table of showbread and parakleo, incense altar and uh, diaconia and ark of the covenant and metadidomy. Could, could, would 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 Moses be able to look forward in time? It's very unlikely. Who who is doing all this mapping? We we are we are the generation. We that so Jesus says many prophets and kings longed or desired to see the things that you now see, and did not see them, yeah. and they desired for you to hear the things that you now hear but did not hear them. <laughs> so you, you get what I'm trying to say, right? Then you go further than that, right? Would there, could there have been an actual correlation between the seven pieces in the tabernacle and the pattern of New Testament worship? What is the liturgy of the New Testament church, right? They didn't have John Wesley's hymns they didn't have contemporary pop and rock uh, Christian worship from hill songs or Maranatha or Bethel or wh whatever era that you belong to, right? Scripture in song or um, whatever it, it may be, whatever tradition you came from, the Scottish tradition, the English tradition, the American, the Baptist, the Pentecostal, the Methodist, all have their own traditions and liturgies, right? Orthodox in Greek and so on and so forth. But if you get to the heart, if you drill down to the heart of worship, right? If you go to the heart of liturgical worship, what is the order of service every Sunday or Saturday or whatever it, is, it may be? It may be a Sabbath service. It may be an Erev Shabbat service on a Friday night. But when you drill down, what do you get? At the very core, you get 1 Corinthians 14, 26. That's what you get. There's no other... There, there are there is no other pattern except this movement or the synergy of seven different things. The leadership coming together, the psalm commemorating the, the mercies of God, the teaching, the word of instruction, the open conversation, the tongue, the instruction, the closed uh, interpretation, that means the hermeneutic or the execution of whatever God says, and then everything is done, including the love feast or whatever, foot washing, whatever that you do in a, in a church service for the building up of the oikos, for the edification of the house, right? Now, did Moses see this? I doubt it. I doubt. He could perhaps have seen the physical temple. He definitely, he built it. But the pattern was pointing as a shadow to something uh, in the far distant, you know, thousands of years later, even to our day. We follow the 1 Corinthians 14, 26 pattern. Everybody does, right? Whether you, you admit it or not, that's how we do church, right? You could theoretically take a church service, break it down into seven constituent parts. The leadership that goes before the service even begins. The um, analysis and the edification of how you are doing week by week and month by month and year by year. And then the actual uh, five components of a church service, the psalm, the teaching, the tongue, the revelation, and interpretation. Of course, you don't always have it in that order and things can 
the spirit may move differently. But that's what revival is. That is revival. That's what, as long as you learn, you draw close to the Lord and so on and so forth. What I'm telling people now is don't look for and don't look for revival anymore. You know, revival came to us three years ago. It was called COVID-19. If you didn't see revive, if you didn't see the Lord's hand and his testing and his drawing his people closer and closer and closer during COVID, forget about it. You're not going to see revival in the future. That was revival. That was our biggest test, bigger than Azusa, bigger than Wales, bigger than the great American awakenings. It was a global awakening preparing us for the last day, right? So hopefully you saw that and you rid, rode the wave. That's how we got King's College because of Mods TV, because of COVID-19. All right. So the question here is, do your eyes see and your ears hear more than Moses and the prophets and the kings? And the answer is yes, right? They could only drink milk. We can have the solid food. All right, let's move on. Next question. Did Paul see in Peter, in 2 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 5, 6, and 7, did he see the uh, pattern of seven in the virtue? You know, when he said, add to your faith virtue and add to your virtue perseverance, uh, knowledge. Add to your knowledge self-control, and to self-control add perseverance, and to perseverance add godliness, and godliness add brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness add love. Did, did Paul actually look at Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3? Did he see these are the seven natural endowments? That means God, man was created good. Not bad. He was created good. Every baby has these seven qualities, right? And and we our beginning was in the perfection of God's creation of man and woman, right? He doesn't make God does not make junk. He makes beautiful. He makes all things beautiful. But originally, all things were made beautiful before corruption came in. Okay, so. The question is, did Peter see uh, Moses? Did Peter see Paul? Did, you know, did Paul see Peter? They were contemporaries. Next question. Did Peter see John? Did Peter know John? Did Peter recognize the seven churches? Most people, when they teach about the seven churches, something broken and Let's throw it away and skip over chapter two and three. No, in King's College is so important. In fact, we are all part of one of these seven churches, right? This is not historical, you know, there's a reason why they are in rubble. Today, if you go to Turkey, you'll find them in rubble because God doesn't live in temples made with hands. That whole uh, Levitical era has been done away with post 8070 uh, when the temple was destroyed he's trying to make a he's trying to make a point right god is trying to make a point uh that god does not live in temples made or tabernacles made with hands and neither by the way do we have the books remaining we don't have the letter to laodicea anymore. We don't have the letter to um, Sardis or Thyatira or Pergamum. We don't have those. We only have the letter to Ephesus, right? And, and why is that so? Because he's wanting to teach us a lesson that of the seven battle, battlegrounds. And that, that is, a, a, that is a, a lesson for us in our next module called Ancient Hostilities right? So we can actually go back before Moses and realize there's a pattern of seven in the seven wicked angels that fell away from God in the book of Enoch, right? This is pre-Levitical. So you can break up all of human history into three parts, 
right? Pre-Levitical, before Moses, Levitical, the time from Moses until the New Testament, and then post-Levitical or Messianic from, you know, AD 70 onwards, from Jesus onwards all the way to our day. It's a Messianic period. So why did John, did Peter see John? Did he know John? Did he understand the revelation? Very hard to tell, but it's all connected in my eyes. It's all connected. And as students and stakeholders of King's College, this is the archetype, the mother of all archetypes. It's called the pattern of seven, right? It's not for leadership. It's to understand wisdom and to understand the design, the sevenfold design. Because if you, you have to go beyond the physical church to the inner ecclesia. Okay. If you look, if you open a durian, right, you go beyond the exterior of the durian, which is very pointy and sharp and dangerous if it falls on your head in the middle of the night, right? Well, if you go beyond that exterior, the hard, pointy, dangerous exterior of a durian, what do you get? You get an architecture that you never imagined existed before. Now, this architecture is seen in the agricultural world. And that's why Deuteronomy 8.8 8 highlights this order and this decency that come together in the fruits. Now, it's not, it's a, <clears throat> it's a third order, it's an agricultural order, but <clears throat> it maps, right? <clears throat> it maps to your seven archetypes in the New Testament. And it maps to an internal structure within the Godhead and uh, within the Spirit of God and unveils the war on saints. It unveils the war on saints. How do we know we're in a war? Well, the way, what does you work backwards, right? What does the Spirit of God stand for? He stands for wisdom, right? So what is the opposite of wisdom? Is deception, right? What does the Spirit of God stand for? <clears throat> he stands for counsel. What's the opposite of counsel? Anarchy, chaos, lawlessness, right? That's the battleground. Here are the seven battlegrounds, right? What, 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 what's the, what, what does the Spirit stand for? The third branch is knowledge. Well, what's the opposite of knowledge? Atheism, darkness of mind, ignorance, what else? Pride, whatever. Okay, so here you have, um, you know, secular humanism, right? This is man is the measure of all things. Instead of under, going humbly to God on your knees, right? What's the next thing the spirit stands for? It's the spirit of the Lord right? It's encouragement. It's enabling. The Spirit comes to fuel our lives, right? So that we can serve others and, and encourage others. Encouragement, if you follow the plan. So what's the opposite of encouragement? Xenophobia, fear of strangers, antagonistic to strangers or anybody who's not like you ethnocentricity, um, xenophobia, right? Fear of strangers, hatred of the other person. That's the battle in, you look at these seven battlefields, right? Next, fear of the Lord. What's the opposite of the fear of the Lord? That's what the spirit stands for, the fear of the Lord. What's the opposite of the fear of the Lord? Godlessness. No, no, you know, complete um, paganism, pagan practices. That's what, that's what, these are the seven battlegrounds, right? The sixth battleground, the spirit of might. He comes to give us might, right? And strength, right? What's the opposite of the spirit of might? Is greed, 
is lust for dominion. It's slavery. It's one people enslaving another people, colonialism, right? And, and, and this lust for, for domination, dominate, dominating other people, peoples, and, and taking advantage of them. So there you have it. That's the sixth battleground. And then what about the seventh battleground, the last battleground in the church? Why? You see, the seventh battleground, what's the opposite of the spirit of understanding? Right? It's non, non, not understanding. No mercy whatsoever. No compassion. Right? He doesn't understand. He doesn't care. It's uh, passivity. Lukewarmness. That's why all these seven churches... It, when we talk about ancient hostilities, right, we're going to be studying about Nephilim and pre-existent, you know, demons and, and weird stuff, you know, um, Eric Von Danikum stuff, you know, uh, UFOs, unidentified flying objects, all this in, you know, these in the ancient apocalyptic, um, well, they didn't have literature at that time. They just built build, uh, tab temples in South America and in Bali and you know, all these strange, like, Uncle what and all that. They're all telling a story. They're telling about this ancient battle between good and evil. But the, the application of the battle is seen in seven different ways or seven wars or seven, the seven battlegrounds for every Christian church and every Christian uh, leader and for the body of Christ themselves. Okay, so... This pattern of seven is unveiling the seven blind spots as well, okay? So you can see this pattern when you look at the agricultural, uh, um, what do these seeds speak about? Wheat, it talks about teaching, right? And um, being fed when you go to church or when you listen to a sermon or you have fellowship and there's a teacher or somebody, somebody who has a, some sort of a, a word of instruction, right? That produces a full stomach, so to speak. You're full, just like wheat or rice fills your belly. You need to have some rice. Or you need to have some wheat in, 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 in the Asian context, right? Then what else? Barley. Barley is talking about every time barley exists in the in the in the Old Testament, it's talking about execution of God's will, revealed will of God. In the case of Ruth, in the case of Gideon, in the case of Elizier, in the case of uh, you know, in so many different situations, barley is symbolic of execution. So we, it's teaching. Barley, it's execution. Then whenever you see grapes, grapes is everything to do with um, mercy and uh, compassion and empathy, right? That's, it grows in a cluster. And uh, there is a, there is a, uh, there's a use for these uh, uh, different seeds to make wine in the case of grapes, right? We make wine with that. And, and wine was what was poured into the, one of the items that was poured into the wound of the traumatized man on the road to Jericho. Wine gladdens the soul, the, you know, brings you out of sorrow. If someone has uh, been in, uh, post-traumatic shock, you know, you give them a little bit of wine. Um, the, the, you know, wine deadens a little bit and wine makes you a little bit happy. And I'm not talking about getting drunk. I'm just saying that um, there are many uses for wine and a little wine is good for the stomach, Apostle Paul says, right? And people take that too too much too literally but anyway it there is an aspect of mercy the delivery of mercy and then what about figs figs 
<clears throat> which one of these do you resonate with? Figs in the Bible, it's all talking about time, chronos and kairos. It's the, the inter <clears throat> intersection between uh, chronos and kairos, right? So fig is always futuristic. Figs and the fig tree, right? If Jesus cursed the fig tree, is talking about the fact that time will be no more. Time will stand still when Jesus goes to the cross. It will be go to zero year. If you look at how the modern academic world, they've tried to um, take away the distinction between AD and BC, right? They don't like BC before Christ, so they call it BCE. <laughs> and then after Christ, they call it uh, CE, common era, right? They don't like to use the word Christ anymore. They are being, being politically correct. But no matter how you look at it, it's still zero. And everything is, you know, at the zero, the zero mark, right? The zero marker. All right. <clears throat> so here we have it. Um, fig, when Jesus cursed the fig tree on the way to the cross, he's saying that there's going to be a zero, a reset of all human history because of what he does on the cross when he says, it is finished. That whole before Christ era is finished. And the time is then reset to zero. Right? Okay. Then pomegranates. Pomegranates, if you cut a pomegranate open, you've got all kinds of agenda going on there, right? Hundreds and hundreds of seeds, right? That is talking about leadership. Why? Because there's one hard, rough skin, thick skin, right? And if you're going to be a leader, you've got to be thick skin. You can't be so sensitive. And that singular uh, commitment to a mission um, and the ability to bring all the other talents together and all the other agendas together into one fruit, that's the pomegranate. That's why pomegranate speaks about leadership. And that that's why this uh, ensign was uh, sewn into the fabrics and the, um, uh, the hem of the garment where, you know, even, um, you know, they say that uh, the prayer shawl sometimes has this pomegranate touching the hem of the, hem of the, uh, the, um, the, the prayer shawl right? Um, and to receive healing. Leadership always brings healing. Leadership always brings uh, um, the accomplishment of the mission that God has sent you forward. And what about olives? Olives, they, they don't uh, exist in a vacuum, right? Olives always uh, needs to be processed just like grapes and just like wheat. In fact, Almost all of these seeds or all of these um, agricultural products, they need to be processed. The state in which they begin with, right? Very few people uh, will, will take an olive. Well, lots of people eat olives when they're ripe with their salad and it can, it's quite nice. But there's another use for olives. It's olive oil. Without the oil, you see, the Mediterranean culture, they, they don't have butter as much as the Western Europeans, right? They have oil. So you think of all the Italian foods, even bread with oil is a staple. Oil is another thing that was um, poured into the wounds. And um, oil uh, and the, the oil lubricates it, uh, olives, therefore represent the uh, genius of those that are able to integrate um, all and smoothen down the wrinkles and, and bring together everybody into one, all right? Um, and then dates, right? Why does it date map to metadidomy? Because 
it's not the sweetness of the date we're talking about. It's the tree that it comes from, the palm tree. And everywhere in the Bible, when you have a palm tree, whether you're talking about Psalm 1, right? Um, oh, talking about those planted by the rivers of water shall be, you know, their leaves will not wither in old age and so on and so forth. The palm tree in uh, the book of uh, the story of um, Deborah, for example, sitting under the palm tree. Palm represents governance and government. So there you have it. Um, a mystery. Uh, did Moses know about Paul? Did Paul know about John? Did John know about Peter? Did Peter know about Paul? <laughs> Blessed are you for your eyes. You're right. Many kings and prophets have longed to see the things that you see, but did not see it and hear the things that you hear, that, but did not uh, hear it. Okay. So there are many other patterns, all right, and perhaps this can be uh, for dissertation level, okay? If you are a, um, if you're going to come in at the graduate school level, um, after you have a basic foundation in theology, then you're going to have to write a paper, right? And um, this paper has to deal with some mystery or some problem that you want to solve. And it needs to research something. So here's something that you could possibly research, the parables of Jesus, the seven parables of Jesus in Matthew 13. Okay, let's go on. Next one. Here's another possible potential area for research for your uh, master's degree, right? Um, to, to look at the biblical feasts of the Lord and write your dissertation on that and study the seven, the pattern of seven, right? So write something about the sevens, yeah? Sevens in Revelation, for example, and so on. Let's go on. Sevens in creation. This is an area for um, further research. You can see how uh, day one and, and day four matched and day three, uh, day two and day five came together, day three and day six and so on and so forth, right? So in creation, there's a pattern of seven as well, seven days of creation. All right, next. And then, of course, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse one to three in the love chapter, Right, lots of people have been asking about this. Right, so here you can see that uh, there's three parts. Can you see there's three parts? There's two archetypes followed by uh, three archetypes followed by two archetypes. Right, so you've got the Paracleo and the Proistemi first, and you've got the uh, Prophetia, Didasco, and uh, uh, the Diaconia. And then you have the metadidomy and the alias. Okay, so here you uh, look at the the keywords here, right? So um, Lian uh, uh, has given us the the clue here. If I speak to, begins the first section. Then, if I sorry, if I speak in, begins the first section. Then, if I have prophetic powers, right? And then uh, if I, right at the end, if I. Okay, so how to read this section, uh, how I came about this was, uh, look at the one, um, some, some let, well, let, we, we can go through it, okay? If I speak in tongues of men. So tongues of men is paracleo because it's conversation, it's opening up potential, it's open. Right, tongues of angels is commanding the angels. It, you're, this is a command element where your very presence and your words open up uh, uh, and tear open heaven so that heaven and earth can 
uh, the prayer, you know, heaven and earth can inter, intermingle, as it were. All right. And today you will be with me in paradise. That's that that was Jesus commanding the angels. All right. And then if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries, so there's your mysteries, there's your prophetia, and all knowledge, there's your didasco. And if I have all faith, okay, the blue, blue color in the middle. <laughs> if I have all faith so as to move mountains. Well, that to me speaks about the plan of God. God has a plan to move this mountain. So I'm just executing the plan, right? I'm moving the mountain. And then if I give away all I have, that's metadidomic, give, right? It's giving shape to society and so on. And then the last one is uh, if I deliver my, up my body to be burned. Okay, that's the zeal of the Eli Mosonary, willing to lay down their life. That's very messianic, isn't it? Very Jesus. Love chapter. All about Jesus. It's all talking about Jesus. All right. Um, so one of the assignments, which uh, if you did not receive, did everybody receive the homework assignment that is required? for completion, one of the assignments that's complete, uh, required for completion. If not, Lian, maybe you can drop it in the chat box there, the link for them uh, in case someone didn't get it. Um, and uh, basically, uh, let me just say that to understand assignment number three in the pattern of seven, right? Uh, will give you the basis for the next phase, which we are going into next year. So if you're with us into 2023 in the academic package, in campus setup, right? Well, uh, you are going to be one of the captains for the course, okay? Super important. And... Uh, what we're going to do now is make sure that you know your stuff. So please, uh, if you could um, uh, fill this in and send it back to to my office, and then we want to make sure that you can you can actually um, uh, um, handle this material. Okay. So you have to register. Make sure that you register uh, at this uh, um, at this website. All right, now let's move on. Then, um, okay. So that's your mods assignment there. Please register with us and your interest. And uh, we need to make sure that you understand the pattern of seven because the pattern of seven. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, will determine, and let's go on to the next slide then, please. Taxonomy, bibliography, and pedagogy. I, I just referenced this on uh, last time we were together, but this is important. All right, this is the campus setup. This is at the heart of campus setup. Campus setup. Um, there's content, there's context, and there is also challenge. So let's take a look. There's content. In theology, we don't have to create theology. It's already there. So the content is there. 2,000 years of content and more, actually, right? Going back to Moses is 5,000 years. So the content is there, right? And the people who wrote the content, well, that's the context. We have to understand the context of these people's lives. That so those two things, content produces taxonomy, right? That's all taxonomy is. It's a going from simple understanding of the content to more and more complex uh, complexity and multiplexity, right? Then context, you understand what were the times uh, and, and seasons of that, of that man's life 
or that person's life as he or she was writing that material. That's your bibliography. That's to understand who the person was. And then comes ped ped pedagogy. And that's talking about how do you teach this content and introduce this bibliography to other students? Well, we are going to use the seven, the pattern of seven. So here, the pattern of seven is immediately useful for the King's College because the college will be built on a code, an unseen code that the students will not be able to immediately understand. All they will see is the, um, the course titles, okay? For example, modalities for life or discovery diagnostics or church history or systematic theology or so on and so forth. They don't know, right? They don't really know. They could never understand the fact that um, uh, they could never understand uh, uh, how um, they could never understand how we got where we how we got to where we are how did we get to where we were right um it's through a paradigm a paradigm okay so uh, that brings me to the end of this particular um uh presentation and i'll take some questions now and we'll switch off